Thank you. So once again, um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists really briefly, as well as uh, our respected moderator. Uh, and then we're going to go from there. Uh, so first of all, uh, our first panelist is Cynthia Blas Robo. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was at uh, I was at uh, the Rio Hondo College graduation earlier today. I was one of the people reading the names and I did so well. This is the first name that I've messed up today. <laughs> so I apologize, Cynthia. Cynthia Blas Reboyedo. Cynthia Reboyedo, Reboyedo is a freelance journalist in Orange County in Los Angeles covering food and culture. She was previously publisher and food editor for the OC Weekly. You can follow her around the internet, various places at SQZ My Orange. Gabriel Chabran, a friend of mine, is a lifelong Southern California resident. Like myself, he grew up in the city of Whittier, where we met when I think he was 13. I'm sorry, Gab, before uh, he moved to Northeast LA. He now resides in uh, the LBC, Long Beach, with his wife and daughter. Uh, Gab began writing concert reviews for uh, the music rag LA Record back in the day, and then became a regular contributor to LA Taco. Uh, and in addition to LAS, Gob has contributed to the Long Beach Post and Los Angeleno. He covers arts, culture, food, and music. So welcome, Gob. Cesar Hernandez is an award-winning culture writer and podcast host from Southeast LA. He and his work have been featured and often cited on LA Taco, LAS, NPR, Vice, the LA Times, the New York Times, Eater, and Whalebone Magazine. In 2020, Cesar was part of the team that won a James Beard Foundation Award for coverage of the intersection of food, politics, and criminal justice in LA's historically underserved communities. And then we have Jeanette Viafana. Jeanette is a community-based journalist from Santa Ana, California, who often covers stories that highlight diverse communities, their issues, success, and personal stories. Much of her work with LA Taco has consisted of covering the obstacles and hurdles of the street vendor community in LA, from equipment confiscations and fines to the complex permitting, permitting system that seems to leave much of LA's beloved vendors working in fear. And finally, we are very pleased to have as our moderator, Dr. Melissa Mora Hidalgo. Dr. H Dr. Melissa Mora Hidalgo was born in Montebello and grew up in the Whittier La Habra borderlands. She's the daughter of a retired Whittier Public Library employee and grew up uh, going to the summer reading club at Woodward Branch. Melissa holds a PhD in literature from UC San Diego. She has taught classes in literature, ethnic studies, and women's gender and sexuality studies at UC and CSU campuses around Southern California. She was a Fulbright scholar at the University of Limerick in 2016 to 2017, and is the author of a very excellent book called Moslandia, Morrissey Fans in the Borderlands that was published back in 2016. Melissa also writes a beer column, Dr. Beer Butch for the James Beard award-winning local indie publication, LA Taco, where she has been a culture writer since 2018. So welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us this Friday evening. Thank you for those of you who, uh, who, who uh, you say bore with us? <laughs> well, we had some technical difficulties, but we're online now. So again, thank you. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our moderator uh, and thank you to the Whittier Public Library uh, for hosting us. So without further ado, let's begin our discussion. Thank you, Mike. And thank you for everybody for being here on a Friday night. Such a special group we have here. So thank you all again. And I'm honored to be here. Anything for Whittier Public Library, you know, anything for my mama. Um, even though she's in cabin, she's in, having a vacation right now. So good for her, but she'll watch it later. So I'm glad you guys are taping this. Um, shout out to one of my tias who's here today too. So I'm so happy to be here with all these panelists. And so um, I think let's just get started because I, I, we have some questions. Gob, I wanna say uh, thank you as well to Gob for, for your help and really uh, um, getting this panel together and for uh, motivating us to, to, to do this today. Um, I think we'll have a really fun discussion. Um, I have a, just a handful of questions. And since, you know, I think we, we wanna hear from all panelists really. So. You know, I think what I'll do is just kind of throw a question out and, you know, I'm gonna maybe just kind of call out whoever I see first on my screen. Pretend uh, I'm having flashback from teaching, just wrapping up the semester. <laughs> uh, so uh, hopefully th this will go uh, well. So uh, I wanna ask everybody though, uh, the first question, and I'm really, I was really thinking about the, the topic and the theme of our um, event, which is emerging writers in independent journalism. So 
let's start. Why not begin? Um, I want to know from each of you, what does it mean for you to be called an emerging writer? And then also, how does independent journalism support this emergence? Right. So I guess since I'm seeing Jeanette first, my LA Taco compañera, let's start with you, Jeanette. So it was, what does it mean to be called an emerging journalist? Yeah, what does it mean to be called a, or to, to, to be an emerging voice in independent journalism? And how does independent journalism specifically sort of support uh, your emergence and, and your voice as, as, a, as a writer, as a journalist in this region? Well, first, thank you for having me and for having all of us. I appreciate it. Um, and it feels, I don't know, it feels really good uh, being called an emerging voice, you know, in journalism. I feel like there's a lot of hard work that goes on behind the scenes um, as a writer, as a reporter in general. And like, you know, any recognition, like it feels good, you know? Um, and um, as far as like how, you know, I'm contributing to um, independent journalism, you know, just being able, I feel like with independent journalism and being able to freelance and work with publications, you know, like LA Taco, like you really get the opportunity to like, immerse yourself into the stories that you're writing about, whether that be food or like more tougher, you know, subjects, like you really get the opportunity to like, just be there present to really take in every little detail of whatever it is that you're writing about. Um, so I think that's how, you know, it contributes to independent journalism. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you for that response. The, the immersion, I think, element is so important. And that's what uh, definitely, I think, the independent community driven aspect really supports. And it's new voices too, you know, new voices. New voices. Uh, eyes, new people, new communities. Um, new communities within our own communities too, you know, because we're all from different parts. Um, so that's very important to, you know, showcasing different stories. Absolutely, we have a lot of coverage amongst all of the panelists. We cover a very wide region, right? Greater Los Angeles, Orange County, parts beyond. So it's very important to have all of those uh, voices on the ground. Thank you for that, Jeanette. Um, let's go to Cesar Hernandez, another LA Taco compañero. Hi, um, so for me, the reason I got involved with LA Taco was because I noticed that they covered a lot of these communities that like I was a part of or that I grew up. So actually, the first thing I pitched was uh, a guide to Southeast LA, because that's where I'm from. So like, yeah, local journalism is super important, because I, I feel like a lot of these places that we cover <clears throat> don't get a lot of shine, you know, like they don't get a lot of like play or like people don't understand them or like, I, I just feel like nowadays, because from when I started three years ago, like, it seems like, you know, we've we've gotten especially with LA Taco, like we've gotten to cover a lot of the stuff that was local to me or, and uh, important to me. Like I got to write this essay for Elias about just like a local pizza joint from Linwood and like, mm. so yeah, like emerging independent journalism really does like allow to cover these like granular parts of the city that don't get a lot of shine. I love that image. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The granular, right? Um, and, you know, both of you so far, and I'll, and I'll ask the other panelists too, but again, that really sort of hyper-local um, rootedness, it seems. And so, um, you know, the, some of the communities that you're mentioning, Southeast LA, right, even parts of Orange County, for example, um, continue to fall under the radar, right, of, of these big, you know, mega corporate publications. So um, this is precisely why we need these independent outlets and, and, and the voices such as, such as yourselves. Um, thank you, Cesar. Uh, so Cynthia, why don't you tell us about being an emerging writer and, and why independent journalism uh, helps support this emergence? Uh, I definitely feel honored to be considered an emerging journalist. Um, I agree with everyone else in the fact that we have the opportunity to tell stories that are often untold. And coming from the alt-weekly world with the OC Weekly, you know, we were really big proponents of that. And now where I'm at in my career, I feel like it's an extension of that. So it's just continuing to tell those stories within our communities that, of, that can often get overlooked. What are, you know, and, and I saw a, a lot of your um, kind of example uh, writing samples that, they, that I looked at before all of this. Uh, but for those of us uh, who are here and who didn't look at that list, the three of you so far, uh, really quickly, can you just name some of these hyper-local things that you've covered? Um, what sort of, what, what kind of piece maybe represents 
uh, your voice uh, as a journalist. Maybe Jeanette first, and then Cesar, and then Cynthia. And don't forget, Gab, I, I haven't forgotten about you. Damn, that's a hard one. <laughs> um, I don't know if I can pick a particular piece, but really any of the stories that I've done on uh, street vendors, since I know it's a lot of what I cover uh, on LA Taco, because um, you know they're everywhere. Like anybody can relate to seeing a street vendor because they're in our communities. You know, like I'm from Santana, but like I have my elotero on Facebook to make sure that I know <laughs> he's coming by, and like I connect with the with the vendors in, you know, in LA, cause like I talk to, you know, I, these are people in our communities that we talk to, that we communicate with. So any of my vendor stories, you know, from mm. the harder ones to like um, the success stories, like, you know, Tacos El Bejón, going from street vendor to a brick and uh, mortar place. Um, so yeah, any, any of those, I think. <laughs> cool, thank you. Cesar, what about uh, you? Sorry. Um, I just recently, uh, they put out a piece on LA Taco this week about uh, a local burger joint in South LA. Um, when I moved out of my parents' house, I, I live in like close to USC area. So it was just a spot that opened up not too long ago and I, I really enjoyed it. it. It reminded me of like uh, Hawkins and Watts, which is like another great like gem. But most of my coverage when I first started was, uh, and I got to give credit a big credit to like Eric Galindo, who was the mm. managing editor at the time, or one of these editors um, at LA Taco when I started in 2018. He really let me like build these guides of like specific regional Mexican food, but also like I did like a South Central guide. So it was, it's just like very like specific city stuff and like uh, regional Mexican food stuff, which was super fun, you know? Great. Hi, shout out to Galindo. And Cynthia, I'm sorry, not Cynthia. I, oh yeah, I, I got you, I'm sorry. Cynthia too, uh, maybe a representative piece that kind of um, you think kind of uh, best represents your voice. Ooh, um, well, as far as talking like hyper-local, I've written a lot of stories for Gustavo Ariano's blog and I've had the opportunity to write about a local restaurant called La Chiquita that's been around and it's in a neighborhood that is um, Logan Barrio mm -hmm. and how he had to maneuver through the pandemic. And I also got to write about the tienditas within Santa Ana that are like in within neighborhoods. So those are some like hyper local stories that I had the opportunity to write about and really meant a lot. And I got to talk to people and, and it also, I live in Santana. So I was, you know, it's where I live and I'm able to share this with the community as well. Great, thank you. Now, Gab, let's hear from you. Gabriel, our co-organizer uh, and also a writer and emerging voice in his own right. So tell us a little bit about what that means to you and uh, maybe something about, you know, like a signature piece or, or something that you're super proud of that you think best represents your emerging voice. Well, um, thank you first, uh, everybody, and uh, uh, Dr. Mel, um, for uh, all the great words expressed so far. Um, I would say that the uh, the term emerging voice is actually twofold uh, in that sense, because obviously we're the emerging uh, voice in terms of the writing, the writing perspective, but also I think it's also uh, applies to our subjects in, in which we talk about. Um, and really giving them a voice uh, and representation uh, as it's related to uh, uh, telling their story. Um, more recently, uh, my work at LA Taco has consisted of uh, a music column uh, aptly titled uh, Taco de Sonido that I came up with. And uh, I just did a feature uh, that went up earlier this week on a group called Reina Tropical. Um, and uh, we talked a lot about uh, the, uh, what it means to be Latinx and uh, kind of sort of demystifying it uh, by, by their own standards. So I think that that would be kind of uh, uh, representative of, of both of those ideas uh, in which we're discussing, so. Cool, thanks. Um, so, you know, since we're talking about uh, some of your favorite stories and sort of what does it mean to, to, to be sort of an emerging voice and stories that you've sort of already written and communities that you've explored, let me now ask you, you all, I'm curious about 
what are some of the stories you want to write? You know, what, what do you see sort of what's part of your, your trajectory uh, in the near future as far as what you want to write about the stuff you're just like, I have to cover that. Tell us a little bit about that, Bibi, and we'll go in reverse order. Let's start with Gob this time. Oh man, um, I feel like I get stories, ideas all the time uh, that, that I want to write. And it's just a question of trying to find the time uh, and the energy to do so uh, as far as that goes. But I think that we're always kind of looking, at least for me, that I think I'm always looking for a story that appears to kind of that that hyper local nature that we're discussing um, to really kind of showcase voices that uh, have not yet sort of been representative. Uh, you want to provide people kind of uh, an opportunity to kind of learn more uh, from a local perspective about people from their communities. Uh, as Mike said in part of my intro, I live in Long Beach right now. It's a very diverse city, obviously, um, with lots of happenings uh, as far as that goes. Um, so I'm always looking for opportunities uh, as far as the people here are concerned and trying to give them an opportunity to kind of uh, tell more of, about where they're coming from. Thank you. Uh, Sessa, let's hear from you. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I'm similar to Gab's response. Uh, it, I have ideas, but also like it's, it's just like finding the time and like sometimes the energy. I feel like it's, it's a lot. It's, I found a groove during the pandemic that I can finally like I'm okay with like writing stuff because I feel like during this uh, it was kind of hard to, you know, it was just, there was so much suffering and I was like, I don't know if people even want to read this. Um, but like now I've found a groove and like, I can see stories that were important, like uh, just the way that like the, it, cause I specifically cover most of foods and like food pop-ups um, just to see how like that world or that community is going to evolve as a result of COVID and mm -hmm. as a result of like what's going on. Um, so I'm more interested in covering stories that really tell, like explain or, or kind of help to understand how that's happening in LA. So more of that, hopefully. Good, thank you, Cesar. And Jeanette, uh, what are, what's something that you're wanting to write? Or you can also think about, you know, sort of what do you think, what do you see that needs more coverage? You know, whether in your hometown, whether, you know, what, what do you see that, that some gaps that you might want to write about or something you've been wanting to write? Yeah, um, I'm like the same as they just mentioned, you know, I feel like there's so much to write about because there's literally, I mean, just walking out your door, like there's so much to write about. It's just, again, like the whole time thing. Um, I, I, right now, you know, I, I dabble more in, in like the street vending, um, but I'd love to get more into like, you know, food. I mean, it's still food related. Um, right now I'm covering more like, you know, like permits and like things like that. And unfortunately, some of the attacks that are going on. Um, but I'd like to get more into food, you know, like, and, cause food has its own story. Like I'm a fan of like folk I work with, you know, like, cause food has its own origin and like the people cooking the food and everything, like they have their own story of why they do the things they do and how they do them. Mm -hmm. And I, I like to get more into that. I think, um, I know it's covered, but I feel like it goes back to the whole new voices, new ways of writing, new ways of seeing things. Um, which makes the story different. Mm -hmm. I think the food, getting more into food. So you mean like food reviews or like food histories or like deep dives into like, like, you know, food ways, you know, like how did we, how come this region eats rice this way and not this way? Like, you know, say I'm curious because this is yeah, interesting. Getting to know more, uh, actually even watching um, LA Tacos, Taco Tuesday with mm -hmm. bands, uh, hearing Laura talk about like, you know, how, where did ceviche come from? You know, like we, we think of ceviche, like me and my family is a big ceviche uh, family. We have family vendors in uh, Ensenada. So I grew up on that and like knowing that like, you know, there's other cultures involved in like what, what we know, know of now as ceviche. So like knowing the histories, who's cooking it, how they're cooking it. And, you know, is it something that comes from their family um, and, and things like that. And then also that gets gets you to know more of like who's living in your community as well and where they're from. So, yeah. So. Yeah, no, that's great. This is, a, you know, the profe in me, I want details, right? Like paint a picture for me and tell me what you mean, you know, because y'all are saying the same, but you know, <laughs> There, there is so much to write and, and exactly, you know, like ceviche, you know, like, uh, you know, 
there are people on this call, I'm sure, who know about ceviche, who've read about ceviche, but have we thought about it from this angle, right? Have we thought about it from this neighborhood? And so that's exactly it, right? And the, this, these are precisely the kinds of hyperlocal stories where we see the intersection of history, of culture, of, uh, you know, travel, of migrant patterns, right? All of these things that sort of converge and clash into something like a dish that you get at the truck down the street, right? So, and, and again, I, you know, I think that this is where this, these stories flourish in independent journalism, you know, and, and there's all kinds of reasons for that, I think, that maybe we can talk about a little bit later. Uh, but I want to also not leave Cynthia out of this line of questioning and discussion either. So um, uh, stuff that you want to write, there's something that you see needs really, that's coverage that, that you just kind of want to, um, to get on that and, and tell us about. Again, just going back to my roots with the OC Weekly and just telling those stories that are often untold, you have the trending stories, which are great, but kind of digging deeper. And um, something that was always taught to me was that if you see something and it like sparks an interest or you feel like, you know, why hasn't that been told? That's a story. Um, so just continuing that. Um, recently, I wrote a story on the last fast border at Chino Centro Vasco. And that one in particular just like meant so much to me. And I noticed recently, just like on the feedback that it made a really big impact for the Basque community too, which is like the best thing you could ask for as a writer when mm. um, you're writing about a culture that is not your own. Um, that's always really nerve wracking for me because I want to like do all justice and do it correctly. And the feedback that I've gotten is just people thanking me for just telling his story and how he immigrated to the United States. And the fact that there is still a, a border residing at some Centro Vasco. And a lot of people didn't know that there was a boarding house in Chino, Chino at all mm. or a Basque community within Chino. So continuing to tell stories like that, that's really important to me. Excellent. I love it. I mean, you're reminding me of the Basque restaurant in La Puente. I don't know how many of you know, know, know about that. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, in another life, I taught in La Puente and it was a thing to go get the lamb barbecue. And, and I don't, I, I know that that restaurant disappeared a long time ago, you know, by long time, what, like seven, eight years ago. I mean, enough, mm -hmm. but when I, so your story reminded me of that. And, and you're right. There's, there's a presence there. There's a history there that maybe a lot of us aren't even aware of because of the mm -hmm. dominant, you know, the Mexican hegemony, wink, wink. Uh, you know, but, but, you know, right, just location, geography, history, et cetera. And so these mm -hmm. stories, the Basque communities and these other kinds of communities, we don't think about Hmong communities, maybe Cambodian communities, right? There are, we have so, so many kinds of communities and, and intersections and migratory patterns and histories here, settlement and all of that, but so fascinating, right? So, all right. Gab, did you, add, did you answer this question? Yes. Yeah, I think I started with you, right? I think so, yeah. Um, can I just add a few things really quickly just based off of what everything say, what everybody's saying? Huh. Jeanette, uh, I think you are writing food stories, you know, in, 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 in a sense. You're, you're writing from a, from a different perspective than the rest of us are uh, in, that, in that respect. Uh, you're writing from it from, I'd say, more of a societal perspective where a lot of us, we, we kind of cover stuff from a... Um, uh, from a feature perspective in that sense. So I, I think, I think in, 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 a, in a way, in your own way, you, you are very much a food writer in that respect. Um, and so my hat's off to you because, you know, you're kind of blazing your own trail in that respect. Um, and I want to, and I want to, and I want to commend Cynthia too on all of her great work on Central Vasco because it's a, it's a wonderful place uh, that I've been going to ever since I was a little kid. And uh, I got to write about them too, as well. Um, and uh, these are places that uh, are, uh, especially after this 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 past year uh, with COVID and everything like that, uh, that were threatened. You know, um, it was uh, they got really close, as as Cynthia expressed uh, in with Bernadette's quotes in her article that uh, uh, they they got really close to closing. Um, and as you just mentioned, uh, a lot of these places, like the one in La Puente, have already gone. Um, so it is kind of, you know, the last bastion, uh, especially if you consider Hotel Noriega, which was another one of the, the crown jewels of the Basque establishment located in Bakersfield, California, which is where a lot of the uh, 
the, the Basque community in the Central Valley uh, uh, found refuge uh, when they came here in the 20s and 30s uh, were located. So um, Cynthia's work is, is, is extremely important for uh, for drawing attention to these these spaces that uh, you know um, we uh, we have threat of losing too as well. So sorry, just had to throw my own commentary on that real quick because oh, uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan of y'all's, so that's why that's why I uh, asked you to be here today. Anyways, yeah. so sorry, <laughs> thanks. Well, sorry, we're all good here. No, thank you so much. Um, let me ask Mike real quick, um, how much time do we have? Do we have time for a couple more questions and then is it gonna be Q and A or, uh, sorry, maybe I should have asked this in the chat privately though. Where are we in terms of like time and all of that? You're on mute, sir. Of course I'm on mute. Um, yeah, no, we, uh, we have as much time as, uh, as you like. Uh, cool. We're 7.07 right now, so uh, you know. Just I use, got some more questions in. Your discretion, I would say, I have a feeling your, your questions are going to be perspicacious ones. So, uh, <laughs> nah, these are going to be easy. <laughs> what did you eat? What's your favorite stuff you ate? <laughs> I, no, no, no more serious. It's a Friday and we're good. So now let's talk about fun stuff. I think it's important though. I mean, I, you know, we are talking about independent journalism and sort of, you know, the gaps in some ways that, you know, when I ask you all about sort of what you want to cover, in some ways I'm asking like, what are the gaps? Like what still needs you know, what are some of these untold stories, right? What are some of these voices that haven't been heard yet? What are some of these excavations and sites that we need to go kind of do some digging? And so, you know, I'm always thinking about that too, because I kind of, you know, Trofe is my full-time sort of, you know, gig, you know, but I'm always on the side thinking about these kinds of stories. And, you know, in that same way, you know, what, where are the gaps, you know? Um, do we just have to tell LGBT stories during Pride Month, you know, like that kind of stuff? See, I think part of what we wanna work against too is this kind of, you know, commodification of, of our lives, of our culture, and this sort of, how do, we, how do we tell something else besides a Selena story? And yes, I love my Salinas, but how do we tell these other stories? How do we really kind of excavate these things? And so, you know, these are exactly the kinds of things I, I you know, I, I want to encourage you all to think about and that I think about and that I want to hear uh, from you all. So for sure. Okay, so fun stuff. Uh, I'm looking at our list here. What was the last great thing you ate or drank? So since we're talking about food and since a lot of us are food writers or we write for, you know, food forward publications, um, I think it would be fun to to, to think about and and when I you know last great thing you ate or drank doesn't have to be from a restaurant could be something a friend made um, what 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 tickled your taste buds lately it could be food or it could be a, a beverage of some kind and where did you get it most importantly uh, I, I know I should I say I'll start I don't know yeah, go ahead yeah start. Caesar you go first sure all right so uh, I have a couple things um, this weekend I had a carne asada and I got meat from a local restaurant, a carniceria in, in Linwood, that's known for selling prime ranchera. And it is amazing. Like it was one of the best I've had in a really long time. And it was very exciting. Um, and recently I had my anniversary with my girlfriend and we went to a sushi spot in Little Tokyo called Sushi Hide, or spelled hide. And that was amazing. And I wanna shout out Birria Palacruda, who's doing this like, uh, vegetable forward concept called OME. They had a mushroom taco that was so good. Uh, I think about it a lot. So those are mine. Thank you. Oh man, I'm, I'm writing all this stuff down as you guys are mentioning this stuff. Uh, Jeanette, your turn. So mine, I guess it's more of what I ate recently that was like bomb. And it's not really a meal, it's just like a snack. <laughs> but my mom makes it all the time. It's a chicharron preparado. preparado. Mm -hmm. So she makes this little uh, ensalada de nopales with cilantro, tomato, onion. Sometimes she chops up the garlic. Sometimes she throws a whole clove to marinate with the limon and everything. So you put that on top of the chicharron and then you put your queso fresco and then your choice of salsa. And some people put cueritos, um, but this time I ate it just like that, con salsa and queso fresco. And oh, it's like the best thing. Like it's just a snack, but like it's bomb. <laughs> so I guess that's like the, the last greatest thing I've ate which was this week. That's awesome. That sounds great to me. Cynthia, what did you eat that was bomb? I recently had uh, East LA Barbecue's smoked beef cheek chilaquiles breakfast burrito. 
it's like a mouthful. I'm <laughs> just saying that. Okay, say one. It was so good. Um, the smoked beef cheek was like soft and like sticky in a really good way. Um, it had the chilaquiles were like perfectly spiced. Um, I didn't need to, like, usually I'm that person who douses like chile on everything. And I didn't have to do that at all. It just like was perfectly like executed. Um, so I would definitely recommend that. They don't pop up all the time, but I recently had them at Milpa Grill. Milpa. So I would definitely look into checking them out. One more time, shout it out the name. Or East the LA Barbecue. East LA Barbecue. All right, hint that mm -hmm. right all stuff down. Take good notes. Last but not least, Gub. Um. Last night, uh, my wife and I made uh, a roasted cod dish, uh, like so, like fish, you know, uh, uh, with a it was like a salad made with mint, grapefruit, uh, serrano, green onions, and lime, and then you basically uh, you roast the fish, and um, and then you put the you put like the salad on top of a tostada, and that's how you eat it, and it was bomb. Yeah. Um, I, it was from a cookbook uh, by one of the former uh, employees of Bon Appetit, Molly Baz. Uh, her new cookbook, Cook This Book, I believe is what it's called. Um, highly recommended. We've been just cooking our way through the entire book. I think we've already made like maybe like nine or 10 dishes out of it now. Um, it it's called Cook This Book by Molly Baz. Um, the library should carry it. I, I, uh, I recommend uh, li uh, libraries carrying cookbooks because it's a great way to kind of uh, try recipes out and what have you. I have a couple of ones checked out from uh, the local Long Beach library right now. Um, so that's something that I made. The other thing I wanted to shout out really quickly, which is something that, that Caesar told me about because uh, I have to convene with him every time I'm, I'm going someplace to make sure that I, I'm, I'm trying something new. Uh, is uh, this place called uh, Katsu Sando in Katsu. Chinatown. All right. Um, and uh, it is a uh, honey walnut shrimp sandwich uh, is, is what it is. And um, it was amazing. Um, it, it was, it, it kind of uh, takes all definition of what you thought about a sandwich out the window and kind of presents you with this whole new thing. So shout out to that place. Um, it's great. I feel like more people need to know about it because I feel like they need more love uh, out there in Chinatown, but great stuff. If you love chicken katsu sandwiches, uh, they have a really nice kind of like Japanese convenience store vibe. So Excellent. cool. And Jack just said they are getting uh, that uh, the Molly Bass cookbook. So look out for that. It's, it's a great book. Thank you, Gob. No, I love all of these plugs for support your local libraries. They're open now, like get your stuff from them. You know, it's a great way to try out cookbooks and all, you know, to, to, to learn things, right? Without having to pay for the devil called Jeff Bezos to deliver things to you. So use your library and, and uh, support your library that way. And I love all these recommendations, Katsu Sando in Chinatown, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, to wrap things up with our panelists, I kind of just want to ask one more thing and to kind of bring us back to the topic of independent journalism. What are your favorite, what, what do you think are some of the independent outlets doing it right? Right, what do you read or what do you think? And, and it could be local, it could be national, it could be international, right? Because they're not always about America. So, you know, um, I, I'd like to hear from everybody, you know, a, a favorite independent uh, publication that you think is doing things right, that you maybe want to model yourself after that you think are just really, that we all should be reading. Uh, so let's start with Cynthia, please. Going back to earlier, I think I believe I called Gustavo Arellano's, it's a blog, but it's actually a weekly. Um, he's giving so many writers like myself and even some of his like students the opportunity to write for him. And that is, that is independent right there. That is like as like grassroots as it gets, like it's really hard when you're an emerging writer that someone to get someone to give you the opportunity, you know, to share your words. Um, I definitely would say LA Taco, everyone who you know, on this panel that writes for LA Taco, you guys are doing amazing work. Um, LAist, uh, my editor with LAist, Alina, she is so great as far as like anything that I've ever 
pitched her. It's like, we we're like spot on with like the type of stories like, I want to tell and, and she's open to me telling them. Mm. Um, just outlets like that, that give you these opportunities um, where sometimes someone might pass on a story, but it, because it is so ground level and mm -hmm. these outlets are not passing on these stories and letting you share them. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, LA Taco, LAist. Um... We're all, you know, I, I'm, maybe I, I don't want to speak for you all, but I know that I'm d damn proud to write for LA Taco, right? Like sometimes I wish that's the first thing that, that yeah, I could put on my academic resume, you know, but because it means so much, you know, in some ways, like some of the, you know, a little bit more than some of the academic work because of that reach, right? Because other people are reading it besides, you know, people with PhDs that are in their offices somewhere. So absolutely, it's so important. Um, thank you for, for these list of things. Um, did I go to you yet, Jeanette? No. Yeah, so she mentioned a few of uh, the ones that I was going to say as well, at least, um, sorry, I didn't say that what, right, um, and recently started reading Gustavo's Weekly because of Cynthia, so um, some of those, of course, LA Taco, I have to shout it out, because <laughs> just like how Cynthia mentioned right now, you know, they've opened the door to me and like have, are always open to like the pitches that I, that I, I bring to the table and like, I don't know, it's like, I don't know. I just, I, LA Taco, <laughs> LA Taco. I just feel like with LA Taco, you know, it's going to sound so cheesy, but like, it's like a taco con todo. You really get everything. Like you get food, you get news, you get culture, you get music, you get everything. And from folk who, you know, are on the ground talking to people and, and making these connections. So, yeah. Thank you. Gracias. No, and I'm looking at, speaking of El Colonel that we have in our midst, we have LA Taco, Capital in Maine, uh, Knock LA as well, right? So some of these other independent publications um, that we should be paying attention to and that we can um, also kind of add to our, our reading lists. What about you, Cesar? Do you have anything to add to our... To our uh, yeah, so exclusively the people who publish me only. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, but LA Taco for sure. I think that they're doing great. Um, I love like Lex's work. Uh, Lex from, from LA Taco who writes for Elias as well, but mostly for LA Taco. He's actually just finished his like two week stint as editor. Yeah. Um, I also really liked, like speaking of Lex, like I thought he put out a great story on the land, which is Jeff Weiss's uh, magazine. And he put out like, I think the best, uh, story on the moldy jam saga you know like the squirrel yeah. i think his story was so good and like you know it, it it was unfortunate that it came out when it did but it was like one of the best i thought nobody really covered it that way personally so the land uh LAist, who i also write for and la taco for sure thank you the land yeah that, that's another one to add uh gob what about you anything else to add to our list uh, not too much in terms of what everybody else said, but uh, I want to say that uh, the piece that Caesar just mentioned right now that Lex wrote, he also wrote it with uh, with Sammy, uh, who also does uh, a, a cool photo series called East of Hoover. It's it's on Instagram and it's about basically the gentrification of uh, Virgil Village in East Hollywood. Um, which is where Squirrel is located to uh, at the same time. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, you can uh, you can find some great information just in terms about that uh, community that's historically Latino, Central American uh, that uh, again are kind of facing sort of erasure, gentrification and, and what have you. Um, the other thing I wanted to give a shout out to as well, um, I was I was attending a, 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 an anti-racism in the newsroom uh, webinar uh, with Soleil Ho, uh, uh, who's the um, food editor, the food editor for the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, and she's doing amazing work over there. Obviously, the San Francisco Chronicle is not an indie publication, but just in terms of uh, BIPOC representation, I think she's doing amazing work. She also mentioned uh, a publication called Whetstone, uh, which uh, is, a, is a print magazine that focuses a lot on um, different um, uh, uh, issues, people of color uh, and what have you in food. And then uh, the founder of that actually just released a really cool Netflix series called High on the Hog, which is about uh, 
sort of uh, African food ways uh, and representing of, uh, in kind of in connection of the United States. Um, and uh, the founder actually goes to Africa and it's a lot about, you know, uh, slave trade and what have you. I've just seen the first episode. It was beautifully produced uh, as far as that's concerned. So uh, I haven't seen all of them, but first episode was super cool. So recommend that's on Netflix. It's called uh, High on the Hog. Uh, if anybody's interested in checking that out, so. Excellent, thanks, Gob. And again, thanks to those of you uh, putting uh, some rec recommendations in our chat uh, for podcasts, for other kinds of publications, um, for you know any other kind of uh, food news you might want to learn. Uh, check out our um, publication list right there in the chat. And it's not all food. Again, we're all you know we're pretty food centric here, just based on I think our our, our topics and the subjects and the publications, but. You know, we cover so much more, right? Music, culture, uh, city permit stuff, you know, legal stuff. A lot of you were referencing Lexis Olivia Ray, who's doing excellent work on police brutality and covering the riots and the protests. And so, you know, I think, you know, one of the things to maybe comment on and, and part of the sort of desire to want to cover more is, that, is the fact, you know, the reality of independent journalism and sort of being cash strapped, right? So, you know, LA Taco is a good example. Those of you who are members, you know, there's a newsletter that goes out, you know, about once a week, I think, where it's like, there's a whole list of stories. It's like, this is what we would cover if we had the resources, right? So this is just my push to kind of, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here, but, you know, to, to kind of keep the, you know, flying the flag for independent journalism and for really kind of making space for, for ourselves and for our stories, right? And to keep pitching and to keep going after these kinds of independent publications to um, really get them to, 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 to expand their coverage and, and to tell the stories that we know need to be told and that should be told, right? Um, Melissa, sorry, I wanted to give another shout out really quickly. Uh, Galindo just texted me and he said, make sure that I say this. So um, it's uh, Locutora Radio, uh, which is done by Mala and Diosa, uh, the, the uh, sort of um, uh, Latinx uh, feminist uh, podcasting network um, that's doing really great work. They have a, 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 a uh, a great podcast that they do kind of, I think it's sort of monthly, but they're also kind of expanding their programming too as well. So you can find them on Instagram uh, also. So uh, yeah, just want to throw that out there real quick. No problem. Perfect. I think that's a nice way to kind of wrap up and, uh, and to kind of now move toward a Q&A. You know, I think that we have uh, some time to open up the conversation a little bit and to get some questions for our panelists. So Thank you all again for being here and to our panelists for their uh, engaging and excellent stories about their forays into independent journalism and, and why it's so important. And these we're emerging voices right now, but pretty soon we'll be established and then we'll be the ones that are right and set in history. So we're already doing it and I'm excited. The future looks great. So thank you so much. I guess now's a good time to turn it over to either Mike or yeah. to Mike just dropped a whopper of a question in the chat uh, as far as that goes. So um, the moderator, that's my job. So let me go ahead and read it. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. So let me pull it up. So a question more than several times in the past, say half a decade, we've read stories about culinary cultural appropriation and the idea that authenticity is troubled when a given traditional food gets modified or when folks outside of a given culture make or sell a dish that they discovered. I'm sort of two minds about this phenomenon. On one hand, I don't think it's right when folks present a dish outside their tradition as something they discovered or pass it off as their own thing. But on the other hand, I kind of feel like the history of food and food ways, perhaps in singular ways that are different from other cultural expressions is perforce a history of mixing and remixing taking long-standing recipes outside of one's experience and making them one's own with one's own ingredients and perhaps culinary techniques from one's own history, culture, tradition. What say the panelists? So panelists, if you wanna look at the chat too, to just look at the question again. But basically appropriation or appreciation, what say you? Whoever wants to go first on this one. You know, this actually reminds me of a really interesting concept that uh, it's another pop-up concept that's happening here in Long Beach right now uh, called uh, Chuntikis. 
and um, uh, Javier Cabral, uh, the the normal editor of um, LA Taco, just wrote a piece on Jules, uh, who is kind of a a beer guy. He works at LA, um, excuse me, Long Beach Beer Lab, and uh, he also uh, does this thing on the side, and it's a really interesting concept. Uh, he's talking about how he uh, sort of reclaiming the idea of the tiki drink uh, in that respect. So it's kind of how sort of, you know, how the tiki culture is sort of, you know, uh, historically seen as sort of appropriative in that respect. Um, but he's coming at it from a person of color lens and kind of giving it uh, a new spin and sort of uh, reappropriating it in, in that respect. So I think when you kind of see that, uh, uh, remixing a, a, of the concept itself, I think you can kind of come up with something really kind of cool and exciting uh, in that sense. Uh, so I don't think I really answered that question, but the, Mike's long question kind of reminded me of that too at the same time. But I'd be curious to hear what my colleagues think too as well. Anybody else? I also think that when you read a story, you can kind of tell when someone's you know, creating something out of appreciation for something that's already been created versus, you know, like someone that, I guess the question said something that they, they pretend like they're the ones who created it or invented it. Um, but I think, you know, just your own judgment when you're reading these type of stories, you can tell when someone's doing it out of appreciation or just because they want to be the ones that are like, that created it. I don't know if that, <laughs> if I've made sense there, but hopefully you guys know what I mean. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And then I'm also, you know, I would again, complicate this because it's, I think it's, you can't, you know, to, to say appropriation or appreciation sets us up in a binary, right? And so we can only go one way or the other. And I think that sometimes we have to go beyond even that setup or that frame because to go back to the tiki drink, like are, are these, so the chunti, I guess, refers to chuntified yeah. medicines. Yeah. So, yeah. really ours to reappropriate probably not right right, right. that's right. what I mean. yeah but you know the chuntification like you know that I kind of get so you know mm -hmm. I think there's always room to to unpack and to question right and that's just definitely throw in there um, yeah you know did anybody else want to speak to this though because I think maybe I, I skipped some folks either Cynthia or Cesar um I'll say something on what I found with like friends of mine that are chefs, uh, as far as authenticity, um, when like restaurants like Taco Maria or um, Irania that now close, but um, they are taking cuisines from their own culture, but you know, redefining them in a sense using their, you know, their education and in what they've learned and the resources that we have here in California, which is like abundant. And yeah. sometimes these chefs will be looked at and as not authentic because, you know, it's not the carne asada that is, you know, maybe more well done or um, they're presenting it in a different way. And that's something that I think we kind of have to change the way we look at this, especially when it is, just a different way that they are trying to present their culture's food, if that makes sense. I know that's not exactly answering the question, um, but I kind of wanted to get to more of the authentic part. That's something that I noticed within um, with some people trying to showcase, you know, food from their culture, but using their skills and their education and, and demonstrating it in a different way. Yeah. Yeah, and even just the notion again of authenticity is something that we have to unpack, right? Because what does mm -hmm. it mean, right? What's an authentic corn tortilla? You know, one that's made in this region or, you know, so, you know, I think it, it'll, it serves us better as writers, as, as thinkers, as researchers, as people who are interested in telling stories, you know, to, to kind of go beyond these initial kinds of, you know, setups or frameworks and to even maybe dispel with or discard with some of these terms, right? To, to think beyond, uh, you know, notions of authenticity or appropriation uh, to, to maybe the practice itself. And, and, you know, where does this even come from? You know, um, yeah, and um, I, I, I think uh, I, mean, I don't know if I understand the question fully, but I'll try to give the best answer I can think of. Um, I, I, I don't know these these questions of authenticity and like, 
I think all of it just comes down to respect. You know, most of the times, like you'll see these cross-cultural kind of uh, products. Like I covered uh, this uh, Anna Jack Thai who does like Thai Taco Tuesdays. And like, it's this mixing of cultures because sure there are like cultural standards or perhaps like boundaries, but also we're in LA and like everybody borrows from each other and like people find ways to like synthesize this new thing. And I think that that's most interesting and like, you know, like I, I'm, I'm with the idea of like respecting uh, traditions and things like that, but I'm also with the idea of like saying fuck all that and just doing like your own thing. Like uh, people who are doing modern stuff, like uh, Machin, he's he's a Guatemalan chef who makes tacos. You know, kind of following the the right of like the Alta California. There's a recent uh, pop up called Walking Spanish that makes like modern uh, Salvadoran food and like they do. They have like a chicken sandwich and they have like short rib uh, pupusas it's just like I, I don't know i'm more interested in like what tastes good and like what's interesting and like the way cultures kind of mix and like it becomes a new thing in la yeah. which is what's interesting to me yeah yeah absolutely and and that's that's the la story right kind of classic in that way right all the ways that people reinvent themselves and the ways that you know, the Kogi taco truck, I think, tells the kind of quintessential stories, you know, especially for those of us or people that are not from L.A., right, who, who kind of maybe coming in and, and sort of, you know, seeing it for the first time or from this outsider's view that, you know, there, it's, it's, there's a lots of ways to tell stories in L.A. and the question of authenticity maybe is not the story to go after always, right? Cool. Uh, I gonna- think... Uh- I just sorry. I just want to jump in really quick uh, off of Caesar's point. Um, I think it's. I think. I think it could be seen as generational too. At the same time, I think that that um, for younger folks, you know, they're coming at it with you know their own sort of thoughts and influences towards ideas, and and definitely you know perhaps authenticity is not going to matter as much too as well uh, at the same time. So I think that it's just kind of up for interpretation. Um, I was watching something else recently. I think it was something on YouTube. I forget. I think it was like a Bon Appetit video or something like that. Um, and these people were eating at a Korean restaurant in New York and they were eating Kalbi beef, but it's a specific cut of Kalbi beef that's called LA Kalbi. And the reason why it's called that is because the, um, the, uh, the Korean restaurants would purchase it from carnicerias. Uh, so these are short rib cuts uh, that you would find in a Mexican market that are now referred to as LA Kalbi, even in Korea, uh, not just here in the United States or on the East Coast where the restaurant was taking place where the video was shot. Uh, but so it's even gone back to the origin of these places too at the same time um, and uh, sort of redefined itself. So I think that that can kind of fit into what we're discussing too at the same time, not just sort of generationally, but, you know, you know, when, when these ideas are kind of introduced, it kind of goes back into, uh, 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 takes on a new form too as well. And I think that that's important too, because while it might not necessarily be quote unquote authentic, uh, I think that there's still value in it too, as well, uh, in terms of our collective understanding as it were. Yeah. Thank you for that. I'm going to go back to the chat and I see someone is asking the panel about, generally speaking, what got you into journalism? What got you into journalism and uh, do you have plans to expand, I'm reading the question, uh, into television or broadcast? So who wants to, who wants to uh, tackle this? Could be one or all of you. What, what, got, what got you into journalism? Cesar, go for it. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to see more of like people like uh, places covered uh, where like I was from or I was hanging out like it was I just wanted to see more of that and then I just fell into it like um, in terms of expanding yeah I've done uh, this year I've done a little bit more like radio work uh, so I've been doing that I still like doing podcasts uh, so yeah I'm, I'm down to do more things like that it's just about like access because i mean also the thing that we're not saying specifically is that there's not a lot of money in this like this is local journalism this is like it's not like lavish or you know very like there's not it's not much money involved so you're doing it because you really care about these places and you want to see them get their shine or like you want to see them get their story told in like a respectful or like a 
a way that really tells people about why this is important. Um, so, yeah. yeah. No, it's true. There, you know, we mentioned earlier that you know part of the thing with independent journalism is that we're always seemingly cash trapped, right? Like, there's always a lot of these stories to cover, and yet, you know, the resources are limited. So, but we do, you know, what we do with what we have is is pretty incredible, and you know, um, it just speaks to all of the great work that that everybody on this panel is doing. Um, Jeanette, yeah, um, same. Right now, I'm I'm mostly writing. Um, I still consider myself fairly new. To all of this so right now I'm mostly writing but like I'm open like I'm down to I want to get more into like filming and like visually bringing stories mm. like, or visually with video um but I'm really down for anything getting into podcasts I've never done it but you you don't say no like you don't know until you try you know what I mean so that's kind of where I'm at right now I do want to expand beyond writing um but yeah and what got me into journalism I've always been a very curious person <laughs> So I like talking to people. I like hearing people's stories. I, I mean, just growing up, like I love, I always tell, even now I still do with my parents, like, oh, tell me more stories of like when you were younger or, or yeah, I just like listening to people. And, um, you know, aside from wanting to cover more of the stories that I didn't really see, um, ref reflect the communities that I'm around or that, you know, that I'm in. Um, yeah, it was that just curiosity and like wanting to, make connections with people and talk and listen to them and hear about their stories. Thank you. Uh, Cynthia, do you like to answer or not? Sure. Um, I got into journalism through, actually I used to have like a YouTube channel where the, the basis of the show was, um, that's kind of where the squeeze my orange starts because that's what it used to be called. But I would interview, uh, people like art walks, I would interview bands, everything was like hyper local to Orange County. And then once I was in college, I joined Cal State Fullerton's radio station. And I just segued that same thing. And I would have people on my show and I would interview them. Um, I would interview them for the first half hour and the second half hour, I would let them play whatever they wanted to play. So that was always like really fun because you kind of got to see their personality through the music that they chose. Um, but you know, very much like Jeanette, I was, you know, I just love hearing people's stories and being able to tell people's stories. As far as like segueing back into that, I do like miss radio in the sense that um, it was live. So you always got that organic excitement from hearing, you know, people's answers and it being on the spot. Um, but right now writing is where my focus is at. Thank you. Gab, anything for us? Um, I mean, I, my, my path kind of follows something similar to, to what, uh, what Caesar and Jeanette, uh, mentioned already. I kind of fell into this, you know, just, I, I'm, I've always been sort of a big media consumer, uh, just in general, uh, just kind of obsessively reading blogs and the LA weekly and the OC weekly, and you know, and it was gotten to the point where I, found myself in conversation with folks who were content creators, although they weren't calling themselves that. I mean, you know, we're talking about journalists in, in that sense. Um, and eventually then I got the opportunity. They asked if I wanted to start pitching ideas. Um, and so I pitched uh, a breakfast burrito list about, uh, about five breakfast burritos you can find on uh, York Boulevard in Highland Park, where I used to live. And from there, I just kind of kept pitching stories. And that kind of opened myself up to more opportunities, as it were. And now I've gotten into podcasts, and I've got to meet all these different people, um, and just kind of start networking and all of that kind of stuff. And it's, it's really what I'm passionate about, you know, and, 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 uh, and I love culture and I love talking about it and thinking about it. And I love stuff like this, where we get to discuss ideas uh, related to it too, at the same time. Um, so that's, that's really, you know, I, I, that's really kind of how I ended up here. Sometimes I kind of ask myself, like, why do you, how did you end up doing this, you know, after all this time? Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, it's been great. And uh I feel really fortunate uh, uh, to be a part of something like this, so. Thank you. 
Well, I think it's only appropriate that we wrap up our conversation by coming back to the topic of writing and emerging writers and specifically any advice that our emerging writers might have to another one. And I'm looking specifically at a question in the chat that's asking about tools or suggestions you have for an aspiring storyteller who may not be the most eloquent writer. Right. So any tips on working and moving away to how, do, how does one find their voice? So maybe we can hear a little something from everybody is a, is, a, is a nice way to wrap up and to remind ourselves of our voices. I'm like, let me say this because I had this question too when I was a student journalist. Like, I was like, how do you guys do this? Stop thinking about it and just what, what, what are you interesting? What are you interested in? Is there something in your community, a particular um, group, food, restaurant person that you're interested in? And just talk to them. Like they're in your community, just show up as you, you know? Like, yes, you're the reporter, you have your questions. And of course you have to be professional, but show up as you. And as far as like writing, keep writing. Cause that's how you're gonna find your voice. Like note this, it doesn't come right away, you know but as soon as the more you write, the more comfortable you feel um, it's gonna come to you. Every, each story you write, it's just gonna start coming to you um, more easy and you're gonna feel it. I know it's not really maybe that great advice but just don't think too much and just immerse yourself in whatever it is that you're trying to to cover and write 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 and that's how you're gonna you know slowly start to figure out your style of writing what things you want to cover and things like that yeah thank you for that does anybody else have any suggestions for an aspiring writer and finding voice um, I will agree with Jeanette that that's what mentors have told me is just write, write, write. Like I couldn't agree with that anymore and read, yes. <laughs> read uh, other writers, like everyone on this panel are like amazing writers. And um, I guess the outlets that you aspire to be like, just continue reading that I'm always learning. And I feel like even to this day, I'm still trying to find my voice um, and you'll always keep growing um but read and write 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 and and that's even advice for myself yeah i i i, I buy into that hundred percent you gotta you gotta write you gotta read and and i'll say too as an older you know well okay i'm 47 i'll just say that to everybody right now i've had many lives you know as a writer as an academic writer as a student that kind of thing and our voices i think change and shift over time right the more we you know depending on our content and, and, and sort of where we see our, our writing sort of living. And, you know, so, I, you know, there's something to, I think, um, it, sort of what, what my offering would be like to, to not be afraid to, you know, don't try to find yourself, like you have to lock yourself into a kind of voice. It's also okay to, you know, we, our voices fluctuate, right? We can sing, we can speak loudly, we can whisper, right? And so just like our voices move like this naturally, I think it's okay to kind of let our writing kind of come to is our voices and to kind of honor, you know, where is that coming from on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Um, Where's your inspiration coming from? And, you know, our voices are gonna shift. There's always a core, you know, and I think there's always gonna be an essence, you know, like you can recognize someone's writing just by reading it, you know? I know Gustavo Arellano's writing now, like, oh man, that's his voice, unmistakable, right? I know Eric Galindo's, I'm getting to know his voice just by reading it, man, unmistakable, right? So there is, I think, a core, but I also think our voices, you know, uh, shift and, and move and fluctuate with, with what we're working on. And I think that that's okay too. Um, I guess I'll give my answer. Uh, I, uh, recommendations. I, I had a, so when I started writing, it was cause I had finished college, uh, shout out Cassie Long Beach. And I wanted to write more. And like, I, I started working for Ali Taco and like, uh, it just kept snowballing. And one of the issues that I had when I first started was I kept trying to write things like an academic paper, like an essay, because I was a history major. So I was like writing this like, oh, like I wrote a list about Birria and I was like, so this is what historian, you know, like it, it just like is not interesting to read as much. So I feel like you have to have a little bit more of like a, you have to find that voice and that takes practice. Hopefully you have a good editor that helps you kind of like refine this like you know you're telling a story you're telling stories about these these restaurants or these people and you let that speak for itself you know that doesn't mean that you can't like infuse your own voice into it like person i think 
the personal really shades in like a lot of these details like if you talk about how your experience to this specific city or part of LA or part of a region or culture really can help uh, you know explain some of these stories um, so a lot of our experiences like just growing up in LA have value and it's okay to infuse that sometimes but I saw someone else uh, and I think they're fighting in the chat right now so I, I won't say anything about that but uh, I think the difference between a content creator and a reporter is that usually the reporters in my experience is we focus we let the subject speak for themselves or like we let the story speak for itself instead of just like making it about us you know when it's a personal essay like you have to know when to like infuse your voice and obviously you know it's it's case by case but you usually allow people to tell the stories themselves um and that's that's why we're doing it because we care about these stories and we think that they have value yeah definitely we do our research right we got to do our research that's part of how you know how we ground our writing right i have to just laugh a little bit though at the you know the you know the struggling with the academic writing right like to, when you're trying to move out of that mode you know, and, and to speaking for a wider audience that that I have to say that was the number one challenge that I have and I still honestly face, you know, because I've been trained for 25 years to write a certain way for a certain audience and I'm, you know, to break out of that. It's a lot of work, you know, and so it doesn't, you know, so in some ways, you know, the, the, the thing about finding voices, like I still feel like I'm finding another kind of voice, right, and, and that that takes time and, and you know, it's all right, it, it, it comes, you know, but yeah, it's the writing, you got to just write, you got to read and write and just got to practice it. And, don't let no one tell you to, to not write, right? Like, yeah, and just don't be afraid. Don't feel don't be afraid to write or to cover a certain subject. Um, yeah, just don't be afraid. I know I say that because like I coming out graduating and like freelancing, it was like oof. Yeah, I had a. I mean, I like you said, you're always growing, you're always learning. Like you never just like stop learning. You know, you're always learning as you go. Um, and I'm still, like you said, our voice grows as well. But I had a huge, like when at first, when I first graduated, I had a huge, I had huge trouble like trying to, at least I think I had a huge trouble like trying to find how, how am I, what type of writer am I gonna be? Or like, how is, how is this, how am I gonna do stories, you know? But just don't be afraid and like write, just write freely. And you know, the editing comes after, but just write. Yeah, right. Write and then edit. Someone said in their, you know, write buzz or write drunk and edit sober. Sure, I, you know, that's why I wrote my dissertation. So, you know, it happens. But, you know, but that's part of the fear, right? You, you spoke about fear, Jeanette. And I think that's something that a lot of writers face, right? You know, there's that, you know, fear of the cursor and, you know, all these kind of cliches we know so well as writers that there's going to always be that fear. Like to this day, it'll still take me really long to write something that shouldn't have taken me that long. But you know, I want my words to sound good, you know, and I, it's, yeah, there's always going to be, I think, because at the end of the day, we are putting our voice out there for the world. <laughs> and that's a scary thing to do. You know, people here in this, we know what happens sometimes when you piss off people, right? And some of you have already been on the receiving end of hate mail or whatever it is from the things that you've written. That's scary, but we got to keep doing it, you know? So, you know, th thankfully we have our emerging voices and we have you know people that are going to lead, lead us through and, and show us the way to do it so thank you again to all the panelists it was an honor to, to lead you all to moderate a discussion and, and to be part of this so thank you all and to Whittier I think I'll hand it over to Mike now or thank you so much um, thank you to all our panelists uh, thank you to Dr. Hidalgo for uh, for moderating that was it was excellent this was such a great discussion it was so rich um, and it was uh, it was great. I felt like I was behind the scenes, you know, at the writer's desk, uh, learning about all your experiences and, uh, and, and listening to you all. I learned a lot. So thanks a lot. Um, so yeah, we're going to go ahead and uh, make sure that we share this recording out. Uh, after the fact, we'll, we'll post it on, uh, uh, on all the usual spots and uh, also post some links to, to um, some of the places that folks can find more, find out more about uh, these emerging journalists and the work that they're doing. So we'll, we'll the conversation isn't over. Um, yeah. And uh, hopefully we can do, do something like this again. So thank you all. And again, thanks to, to everyone who came tonight. Gracias, everybody. Have a great weekend. Peace.